Robin Wall Kemmerer, she says this incredible thing. We talk a lot about how much we love the earth, but do we really believe that the earth loves us back? And if you believe that the earth loves you back, you have to understand that love is a verb, that you have to take action, you have to participate in that in your day-to-day -day life. The Balske is many things to many people on a biological level. This is a riparian floodplain, which is home to the, the Rio Grande and to cottonwood forests and saltgrass meadows and all kinds of different micro habitats that weave themselves together to make a resilient mosaic of ecological functioning and a system of interconnected life. My name is Julia Bernal. I am from San Diego Pueblo. The Bosque really has been this culturally significant and spiritually significant area for, for Tiwa people. We identify our river as a mother. Um, her name is the Beit La Shuri and that is our Blue River mother. Being a part of this ecosystem where we're taught to have reciprocity between our river mothers and our land, our mountain, and our animal and plant relatives. Bosque is the Spanish word for forest, and it means the forest along the river is what it's come to mean um, for most of us. It's a riparian ecosystem, and riparian is just by the river. So it's that interface between a terrestrial ecosystem and an aquatic ecosystem. Major native plants that people will commonly see in the Bolske have changed over time. As the water use has changed, so has the plant community responded. So the plants that we know today might not be the same plants that our grandmothers or great-grandmothers thought of as the most common. The cottonwoods are one of the most common and most obvious plant species. They're native trees. Also, the coyote willow is another very common thicket-forming shrub that grows along the riverbank. When I walk into the bosque, I, I completely disappear. I gain perspective and you, know, you enter into a space full of these creatures that are vibrant and lead these dynamic lives. And it's an invitation to be a guest in their home. If you were to fly in an airplane over the Middle Rio Grande, you would see the geographic rift that is the Middle Rio Grande. It's taken millions of years for this to, to form over time. And I say this because we have drastically changed the physical characteristics of the river within the past 200 years. It's a mere strip of, of what was left. I mean, it, the, the Rio Grande was wider than it was deep. The bosque ran all the way up to the, the city limits, way down to the mesa. The river was very braided, had a lot of different channels, and it would flood up into the bosque, and the floods would be um, scouring floods. Pueblo people over the centuries decided to settle more along the middle Rio Grande. Pueblo people have been diverting and have been um, utilizing watershed management strategies since pre-colonial. Indigenous peoples that were utilizing the water um, and definitely utilizing the drainage from arroyos down into the river, but there wasn't a huge manipulation of the system. But then you have the European, the Spanish that came in and actively started to manipulate the system. Albuquerque that was founded 1706 and kind of this 
growing European establishment here and the displacement of a lot of the indigenous peoples and kind of that shift in how the system was handled. And as those populations grew, um, having a river that floods, flooding businesses and homes, there became more and more pressure to, to kind of control that system. Over the last 150 years, our land and water use has created the changes that we see today, that we have normalized. What we see now, we, we think oftentimes this is just how it's always been, but in reality, this is the environment we've created through our land and water use. The water diversion, including dams, irrigation ditches, land conversion, meaning changing natural floodplain habitat into farms and urbanized environments. As a result, we have lost large percentages of Volske land itself. We've lost astounding amount of our wetland habitats. The groundwater pumping that we do also creates these changes. We have reduced the biodiversity and the resiliency of this landscape and we are feeling the effects of that. The system is now shifted because of, of that river regulation, but also we have impacts of climate change. Not only have we shifted the flood events, but now we have less snowpack. And so we have less water coming down the Rio Grande anyway, and it's all spoken for. And so how do you manage an over-allocated resource that is actually critical for native vegetation establishment. You know, the planning department told us when we began our pushback as a community organization that they had received more applications from developers in recent years than they had ever received for developing the land directly adjacent to the bosque. We're changing the zones from low density houses on A1 parcels where only a couple of houses are supposed to be allowed because it was zoned for farms into these multi-story structures that don't just block the aesthetic view, they, they damage the ecosystem around it and put pressure on these finite resources. We want to use this language of smart growth, sustainable development. These terms, they all sound really wonderful, but the truth is any development alongside the bosque system is, is frankly unethical at this point. Humans need water, humans need housing, we need farms, and so we need to come up with ways that we can balance these needs that shows respect for all life, not just human life. There are a lot of creative solutions to better land and water management so that we can protect the biodiversity and resiliency of this landscape. Uh, moving into the future, as we expect hotter temperatures and more loss of water in this environment in the decades to come, we need to start planning for those changes now. If you don't love the Bosque, if you don't understand it or appreciate it, you're certainly not going to want to spend effort into trying to maintain it or save it or shift it or support it or be involved in it. My name is Marco Sandoval, and the organization I represent is Storywriters. Let's do our check-in, and then we'll get ready to go, okay? We have noticed in our program that a lot of the students who come through have either never been to the Bosque, despite living super close to it. We find that students can identify super easily dozens and dozens of corporate logos. But if you ask them about anything in the bosque, what is this? It's very hard. Even the most common thing that you see, the cottonwoods all around them. How sad is that? That we don't even know the names of uh, the plants that surround us that have been here with us 
for thousands of years, as have our ancestors been in this area for thousands of years. That's our goal here, once again, connect kids to those names, connect them to the outdoors, and kind of reintegrate them into their, their cultural and uh, historical and uh, natural heritage. How do we get people involved in hands-on learning, experiential learning? And so um, one of the things that we do in BEMP, um, we have our, our science education and stewardship pieces. And the science is largely done through that education piece, which is students coming out with their teachers and learning to collect the data. And so that stewardship piece is, is critical. It's hard for families to have the same access. We don't all have the same access. And so if we're able to bring a school out and allow the kids to just be at a site, listen, or explore. The Yerba Monster Project has mobilized the community to come in here with hand tools and remove non-native invasive species, particularly Ravenna grass was prolific in this area. And I'm happy to say through community involvement and community dedication, uh, Ravenna grass is now scarce in this area. We also replant and reseed native plants. And so we are creating an opportunity for native plants to rebound and to reestablish themselves. People have a very good time replanting life. It's one of the most uplifting things we can do in an era of devastating environmental news. We feel that we are shifting the momentum in a more positive direction. More on a human level, people that come to the Bosque, that come to the river, or any waterway for that matter, should come with respect offering your respect to her, I think is really a big step towards understanding that we have been managing, we have been stewarding water and these lands since time immemorial, and we, we lead that stewardship with, with respect and, and understanding that our Earth Mother has superseded us in terms of time and we should respect her existence and, and practice reciprocity with her um, in order to ensure that well, we have a clean environment. We don't have to always feel like destroyers and exploiters of environments. We can actively decide to play a positive role and teaching the youngest members of our community uh, ways that they can do that will perpetuate that into the future and inspire them to come up with new ideas as they become adults as to how they can care for this land. We want kids to, one, know the stories of their ancestors, you know, and it's not, it's not always going to be pretty, but we should know where we come from. It does help to inform an identity and inform who we are, is the decisions that our ancestors made. So something we talk about too with the children is, uh, you know, your ancestors made decisions that affect your life as you're going to make decisions that are going to affect the lives of people after you too. So you should make probably the best ones, the wisest ones, the most responsible ones that you can.